Welcome to Seeing the Full Picture, a podcast about systems thinking for health systems. This is a special podcast series from the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. It was developed with the George Institute for Global Health. Episode 4 of our series is about low- and middle-income country experiences in systems thinking. This episode draws on the experiences of two practitioners using systems thinking in this context. Both are medical doctors, and one works in India and the other in Syria. From each of them, we will get insights on real-world applications, discuss challenges related to resources, training, environment, power, as well as short-term and long-term considerations in applying systems thinking. I'm Devaki Nambiar, and I'm a health policy and systems researcher working at the George Institute based out of Delhi in India. Hi, my name's Stephen Jan. I'm co-director of health system science at the George Institute for Global Health in Australia, and I'm also a health economist by training. Before we start this episode, my co-host Devaki and I will just reflect on a few key aspects. You know, I think one of the first things that I was excited about is that these are sort of you know, mid-career scientists really sort of in the thick of it and are starting from a position or are already working from a position of using systems thinking, right? Absolutely. I I think you've touched on a really good point that they're mid-career researchers, but I think Mm -hmm. perhaps even more relevant is that they're both medical doctors. And and Mm. it's interesting that the view of the world as medical doctors is shaped by this systems thinking approach. Again, my perhaps misguided preconceptions are that, you know, a medical doctor focuses on the here and now, the patient in front of them, and Mm. is about sort of, and the aim is to sort of filter out everything else that's going around them and focus purely. And it's interesting, um, both Karim and Prasanth really sort of highlighted the importance of, yeah, the broader systems thinking in their day-to-day practice. And I was just thinking, you know, it's, they've come up right against it, both of them, right? Kareem in working in conflict settings um, in Syria, working in field hospitals. And I'm struck that, you know, Prashant also is works very much as a medical doctor, working with a tribal community. I mean, I, I think one of the other reflections that Kareem had was to some extent differentiating perhaps what the experiences may be of his, uh, his peers in high-income country settings, but then also thinking that actually, no, even in high-income settings, it may be the case that you need this broader lens because you have so many uh, sort of factors weighing in in, in trying to address sure. the needs of an individual patient, right, given their background and whatever else. So I think it was a big learning from LMIC doctors that is perhaps globally relevant. I was really struck by some of the situations that they've described, in particular Karim talking about um, delivering care within, you know, field hospitals built in caves and facing airstrikes and uh, and those sorts of settings. You know, how do you how do you think in systems terms? But clearly, it is relevant even in the most extreme circumstances that they've highlighted. Yeah, and I, I think these are both doctors who. Uh, are asking why, right? Um, and going to causes of causes, and uh, you know, you can you can see a sort of inclination to uh, to dig deeper in terms of even addressing immediate medical needs, because it's so obvious that you have to go further uh, further down, you know, to understand why the situation or why the the phenotype that you're seeing is 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 what it is. So, and and I think for for both of them. The, the idea of listening, the idea of um, uh, Prashant talks about um, sort of humility. And again, as some of our other speakers in other episodes of this podcast have said, uh, reflexivity about your position. I saw that acutely and yeah. was very impressed with the level of self-awareness that, uh, mm. that Prashant and Kareem were sharing with us. You know, I think that's probably something that uh, characterizes systems thinkers, isn't it? The, the humility and, and reflexivity. Yeah, that's that sounds great, doesn't it? And that makes me want to be a <laughs> through and through systems thinker. It's like you know, have, having yourself sorted in the in the craziness that surrounds us, yeah, especially yeah. COVID, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us uh, wherever you are in the world to hear about systems thinking. So today we're quite excited to have joining us uh, two very distinguished guests that we're very excited to hear from. 
First, I'll introduce Dr. Abdul Karim Exayez, who is a Syrian medical doctor. Karim is also an epidemiologist with significant experience in humanitarian and conflict-affected settings, and he's had a focus on protracted conflicts. Currently, he's working as a research associate at King's College London, where he leads a large program on strengthening health systems in northern Syria. Welcome, Karim. Lovely to have you. Thank you very much, Devaki. Joining Kareem is Dr. Prashant N. Srinivas, who is a medical doctor and public health researcher with experience in working in primary health care and community settings in southern Karnataka, India. Prashant leads the health equity cluster at the Institute of Public Health Bengaluru, and he has worked on the intersections of health care and health systems with ecological and social systems. And his focus has been particularly on health inequities, as well as the social determinants of health. Welcome, Prashant. Thrilled to have you. Thanks. Lovely to be here. So uh, this episode will focus on the uh, low and middle income country experience. And what we're particularly interested in is, is the experience of, of both of you in working as practitioners as well as researchers in that context. So what we want to look at is uh, applications of systems thinking, discuss what is needed to overcome challenges that might include training, political, financial, whatever, and consider what's needed to encourage more systems thinking to strengthen health systems. So let's get straight into it. My first question, and it's just a general one, uh, in low and middle income country context, what is the promise of system thinking? By that, I mean, what does it do to help us to achieve as researchers or as policymakers? Uh, Karim, perhaps I could I'd start with you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Stefan. And, you know, starting with system thinking, maybe I would share how I moved personally from kind of focusing on maybe disease-specific interventions to more having this system thinking. So when I was doing my training program in neurosurgery, I think this was in 2010, like 11 years ago in Syria, and then the conflict started. My focus was really on providing surgical interventions, mainly war trauma and also neurosurgery. But then because of the emerging public health threats, I was noticing that these disease-specific interventions might not be enough and we need to widen our school. So that's why I kind of slightly zoomed out to see, to explore what are the health threats and how we can be prepared to fight these health threats. And this was specifically in 2013, when the polio has re-emerged in Syria after more than 15 years of being free of polio. So the, the polio outbreak you know, showed me the importance of having system thinking because you cannot fight such you know, a national scale health threat without having this system thinking. But the challenge was that in the rebels health areas in Syria, there was no health system. The Ministry of Health in Damascus, they withdrawn from all of these areas. And these areas were left for different actors, including humanitarian actors and you know uh, other unusual actors and local networks. So it was impossible to coordinate a national scale uh, response without having systems thinking. So that's why we started you know, to build health systems again, to think about the different aspects, not only, you know, polio specific interventions, but all about supply chain, about human resources, about information, and about other aspects. And that's where really I started thinking that without system thinking, we cannot build resilient uh, health systems. And I think especially in low and middle income countries, the promise of system thinking you know, considering the low and scarce resources, I think system thinking would help us in best utilize these scarce resources. And also it will help to have more integration between services. So if, you know, consider, for example, disease-specific interventions like TP-specific interventions and other sort of um, interventions, if we have more kind of an overarching system that coordinate and integrate these services, I think we would have much better outcome. And this would end by having more comprehensive approach that we will cover more services and also we will be able to have better outcomes. And lastly, I think this will help us to have better sustainability 
in terms of uh, our interventions. And remember, when the world started to talk about Millennium Development Goals, if we explore the goals, these goals were more kind of specific to certain the health ones. They were specific to uh, diseases or different type of mortalities. For example, the fourth goal was the, to reduce child mortality. The fifth goal to, uh, about maternal health. And the sixth goal was more specific to HIV and malaria. But then moving in the new era with the sustainable development goals, we, the world had more kind of systems approach. In the sustainable development goals, we do not talk about disease-specific goals. The, the third goal in the sustainable development goal is good health and well-being generally. And health is streamlined across other goals. So I think sustainability is another, is another promise as well. So that's interesting how you've linked that to sustainability and, and resilience. And I think that uh, it does strike a chord with, with a lot of people who are doing research in, in low- and middle-income country contexts and understanding uh, the drivers of those goals. Uh, Prasant, I was wondering if I could get your perspective on this issue. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, very vital for any any kind of change, any kind of transformative change to happen on issues like health equity, for example. Without taking a systems approach, it is going to be extremely difficult to actually achieve any change. Um, and I think Partly the reason is because we are, I'm speaking now from uh, the Indian uh, system with which I am most familiar with. And in India, uh, medical training, interventions for you know healthcare reforms, health sector reforms, all of these have had several decades of very narrow focus. Partly I would blame a lot of the development funding, the whole, the way in which uh, global health and health system reform advocates uh, have for their own reasons, perhaps to achieve very predictable outcomes, to show change, they have taken the shortcut, I feel, of, you know, very narrow intervention. So I think we've, we've become a bit acculturated to having predictable programs, programs that we can control. So by design, then you end up with extremely narrow uh, kind of programs. And I think this, this has become part of our training, our orientation into public health. So I think we really need to challenge that. And systems thinking is a powerful way of embracing uncertainty, embracing the fact that uh, we may not be able to, for example, in two years, move some, uh, some particular disease control goal from 75% to 96%. And systems thinking allows us to be a bit more comfortable with uncertainty. And I think that's extremely important because there's, there's a lot of, I would say, uh, educational input that is driven into medical and public health training to make us believe that our tools are near perfect and that we go and apply them in some setting. You know, we do, uh, you know, some uh, quick analysis, modeling, et cetera. And then we have a program and now we implement it and voila, two years later we have and it's not like that. I, I, I think everyone agrees it's not so predictable. So systems yeah. thinking allows us to move into that, I feel. I think that's a great point. This idea of narrow short-term interventions that you raise as, I suppose, the antithesis of systems thinking is a really interesting one. I was wondering if you have any examples of that type of program that perhaps doesn't sort of address the problems that you are talking about? Several. I mean, take, for example, um, the idea of institutional deliveries as an important uh, way of improving maternal health. I think the way we went about designing improving maternal health is by narrowly focusing on what will get women into hospitals. And, and eventually, the idea of improving maternal health became about what aspect of maternal health can be accurately measured and yeah success shown and it's very easy to, to to measure how many women went and delivered inside a primary health center what was not easy for us to show is how they experienced the maternal health care in that facility so that you know immediately went out of the window what was more difficult to understand is do they want that and is there another way in which we can you know organize maternal health care which makes mothers feel safe 
so many others you know cash transfer i mean conditional cash transfers is another example and the way in which we go about performance based financing for example the way in which we say okay you know uh, how much more money uh, is going to make a certain health worker behave in a way we would like her to behave for example so the very premise of these kind of reforms smack of a very narrow understanding of what motivates people and why health workers do what they do i think that's that is really interesting and these are issues that are universal are the issues different in low middle income countries from what they would be in high income countries maybe i'll start with percent this is not my own insight but what i've increasingly begun to read uh, from the health policy and systems research and other communities is the misleading basket of lower and middle income countries i think because it's it's convenient and it's certainly better than uh, you know developing uh, <laughs> countries at least from my perspective it's a category of countries that that is easy to you know uh, quickly describe as lower and middle income mm. but i think it's extremely difficult for uh, any of us to to be able to comment at that scale already for example you know if if i listen listen to my um, colleague uh, uh, here abdul karim about what uh, he's uh, speaking about in conflict settings i mean th- this is very very particular context even within lmics so i think while it is convenient i i think it's also very difficult to be able to abstract sure. um, out to the level of lmics but what some things that i clearly see is which tends to bind many of uh, lower and middle income countries context together is the fact for example of great macroeconomic shifts and this is certainly true for india right. and in embracing the effects of this kind of macroeconomic shifts uh, within health will not happen unless we you know expand our lenses and we move back and ask you know why are we seeing health reforms go in a certain way i can give a practical example you know just a few days back on social media i was looking at announcements of outsourcing of services in government hospitals uh, to private players you know and this is seen as a very quick reform how can we improve care in government hospitals by quickly contracting them out to yeah. you know private contractors yes it's probably a quick win and you can have the contracts ready and quickly give away these uh, services to private players but what are the probable uh, consequences of this it's, it's again something in which you know we need to look at the uh, the whole system and the reason why this happens is also because of the macroeconomic shifts i think that we are experiencing yeah. and often yeah. we don't integrate these explanations into our um, research i think but that's one of the things that we we do need to appreciate is the, the enormous uh, economic macroeconomic shifts that uh, some of the lmics our experience as context to some of the health system reforms that, that we see and um and that must have enormous impact on on the success or otherwise of these initiatives if we do not actually integrate these wider explanations into mm-hmm. our evaluations let's say of how these contracting services are working or not working we'll mm-hmm. then tend to focus on the micro and meso and we 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 completely forget Uh, yeah. the wider context so in some sense coming back to your question i feel in in those lmics where these kind of conditions prevail we can figure out a few other similarities so to speak between lmics but there are also sure. other lmic settings where these are not the conditions uh, many of the fragile and conflict affected states for example which is a completely different set of context so speaking of which i, I might pass over to uh, kareem and, and just maybe ask you how is it different in conflict and post conflict sit- settings from say what you might experience in high income country settings i would start with you know having different issues that you or health systems in general uh, are asked to tackle in conflict and post conflict settings so most countries in complex settings would have double or triple burdens of dealing with mm-hmm. different health threats so yeah. it might be in high income countries that the focus would be on non communicable diseases while in conflict settings you need to you know devote more resources in on war related uh, trauma and for example in a setting like syria the truth burden was was trouble even because we have the non communicable diseases and we have emerging communicable diseases of great threat and then you have the war trauma you have trouble burden that you need to have in mind when designing these systems approach 
And also the, the other challenge is lack of resources, especially human resources. So, I mean, in complex settings, there are new source of challenges, for example, attacks on health care and violence against health. In Syria, I used to work in field hospitals that were built into caves or underground just to protect these hospitals from being attacked by shelling or by airstrikes. So these sorts of challenges means that you have less resources, you know, less health infrastructure, less health workers. In, in Syria, I think more than 50% of the health workforce have left the country or some of them were killed as per the Physicians for Human Rights. They documented the killing of more than 900 health workers since the start of the Syrian conflict. So these new challenges impose new issues for systems to, to tackle. And I think the uh, another challenge is the lack of leadership as well and lack of coordination is in, in such settings you would have you know uh, what used to be for example a health system then it would be kind of parallel systems imposed by different actors you'd have humanitarian actors doing their own things and then you have kind of cluster coordination somehow and then you would have private sector and other actors without kind of one national or sub-national leadership, which impose really um, further uh, challenges. And also the weaknesses that you would have in different institutions, because in, in system thinking, we should not think only about health. We should think about the intersections with, with other sectors. If you have, for example, you know, a very weak local market, then this will affect you know, for example, access to food, and this will affect nutrition and will affect health. So all of these issues, uh, I think, in conflict and post-conflict settings are very much uh, faced on, on a daily basis. I think one of the solutions would be, again, to have the system thinking, to have this kind of comprehensive approach of how to tackle all of these uh, issues in uh, a manner that would mean that I would not have only focus on health, but also on other sectors and how to build and strengthening the systems. And I think uh, there should be a, um, a focus on strengthening local capacities. And I think this particular point is often overlooked by humanitarian actors in particular. Uh, humanitarian sure. actors tend to focus on their own interventions without really investing and strengthening local resources. That's very interesting. I mean, it, it does strike me that everybody has their own sort of interests when, when they're at play in, in different in the health systems. And what we don't often recognise is different forces pulling in different directions and they're not necessarily uh, well coordinated. So I think it's a really interesting example. Thanks to you both for sort of laying out the complexity of this, the scenario within which you work, where there are some running threads, whether it is the macroeconomics or the geopolitics of, of the context in which you work. And so what I was wondering is, given all of this and that we are, ourselves are sort of actors in the real politic or the dynamics of the system, I was wondering, and perhaps Karim, you could continue talking about this. How have you applied systems thinking tools? I mean, you were talking about social determinants, you were talking about capacity building, but what have been your approaches to use a system lens in, in the very vexed context uh, that you're confronted with? Sure. So I will give a few examples on how we try to have this um, system thinking approach incorporated within our interventions. So first with a kind of humanitarian needs assessment, because most humanitarian actors used to do these um, at, at, at the initial phase. So designing joint um, multi-sector needs assessment is a starting point where you focus not only on assessing needs, but also identifying available resources and assessing local capacities and trying to see where are the opportunities that I can you know, uh, invest and tap into local resources. So then I'll give the example of the polio response again. When we were struck by the polio outbreak, we were sure that non-single actors would be able to respond solely to this outbreak. So we should have kind of a collaborative approach. And when I was working in Save the Children, we were responsible for to support one covered rate in northwest of Syria. And we thought that the way we will go towards this is to build a local network that would act as a local health system rather than supporting 
you know, different bits of interventions here and there. And we started this approach connecting local networks with each other and investing in what used to be kind of a medical council of one district. But then this medical council, after a few months of uh, monthly vaccination campaign, grown to be really a local health authority. And this local health authority since 2013 until this moment acts as a Ministry of Health in this region. And this was because of these the, the continuous support to not only you know, polio interventions, but all other interventions and investing in kind of the core functionality of these of these groups. And other actors, they, they had a similar approach. The WHO-led uh, health cluster in Gaza and Tab, they invested in these kind of local, uh, naturally structured bodies. Another example is our approach to health information. In Save the Children, we were leading um, a, a kind of a network of um, about 10 health facilities. And most humanitarian actors used to do this paper-based system of health information. But this would not be helpful in informing decisions. And we started to build an electronic medical record system. And this was surprising. In complex settings, you know, normally you would not have electronic medical records. But we thought that local resources here are well prepared to accept this. So we started this process. In a few months' time, we built an electronic health information system, which was super useful. And this is still functioning. And furthermore, this boosts other actors to think about what it's called central projects. So rather than focusing on one hospital or one health facility, let's think about how we strengthen this system. And for example, there, there has been a central project for health information system to support all the areas, you know, the sub-national area, with an information system that can inform policymakers and also inform uh, health actors. And there are several other, other examples, I think, would have this shift from, you know, uh, narrow down uh, focus to more kind of a wider focus with this out. Thank you. That's really interesting. And I'm wondering, just to follow up on this, uh, Karim, what is the role of sort of conveners in doing something like this? So what what do you feel your own role has been in really trying to transition and shift a, a rapid response into a governance structure, if you will, for an area? Coming back to the, the poly example that I, um, I mentioned, so in the beginning, each organization, they were trying to do their own things. But I, I would not mention names here. But for example, one organization, they said, we will be responsible for vaccinating this single camp. And that's it. And by the way, they were doing full expanded program for immunization in this single camp. And we were arguing with them. The outcome of this is really, you know, uh, it's very little because you're not building a herd immunity. Those, you know, children in these camps would would go out and they will, you know, mix with other children and you're not building a herd immunity. And we said, rather than for now doing expanded program for immunization, which we had the resources to do so, by the way, we will focus first on polio and then try to invest in the infrastructure and in the core functionality of this team to be able to run the expanded program for immunization later. And that's what we've done. It took us two years to convince other actors and to convince WHO and other actors that we are capable to you know, invest in this core team. And the result was that some other actors, for example, Gates Foundation, they recognized, you know, the importance of this role. And the Gates Foundation, they said, you know, you know what, we will support this, not only the polio vaccination program, but all your plan for the expanded program for immunization. And in two years' time, or in four, three years' time, we were able to reestablish the EPI for the, in, in the whole region. And this EPI was the whole, uh, the lack of EPI was responsible for the re-emergence of different threats. So in this way, we started fighting one specific disease, which is polio, but then we ended up by having a system that tackled all vaccine-preventable diseases. Thank you, Kareem. That's great. We turn now to the Indian context. Prashant, how have you sort of used a systems lens? Kareem's described how, you know, through polio, they've gone wider, wider, wider with a longer and longer trajectory of impact and line of sight. Um, how have you approached this in applied systems thinking uh, in your work in tribal health or health inequalities, health equity? 
Yeah, I can think of two examples, perhaps if there's time, I, I can share both. One is uh, in uh, uh, tribal health, but in understanding uh, change within public uh, services. So uh, there was this evaluation um, I was doing of, uh, of a program, a training program. And this is a common template no, in, in global health. You know, you, you call it capacity building, you call it whatever, but at the bottom of it will be a training program. Um, we call it leadership development. Ultimately, it will be a training program. I think we have done this everywhere. In all countries, we, we hope that training will bring about change. So I, uh, for my PhD, this is already now five, six years back, I looked at uh, trying to understand the nature of change where it occurs uh, in a district setting and why it doesn't occur where it does not, why it occurs where it does. Especially I focused on elements outside of the training because the natural uh, sort of thing on uh, evaluation is typically to get into the training elements itself and then trace out the change. But I tried to trace it backwards. So what are all the kind of settings, workplace settings, team environments, hierarchies, um, and wider systems environment that are likely to facilitate or you know impede change. For example, what becomes very important is the nature of commitment that the participants have towards change. Did they want this change? Did they seek this change? You know, uh, change agenda typically is often located within you know quote unquote people like us who wish to change uh, things. So to cut a long story short, you know, I mean. Tools I used were things like uh, building program theories, which uh, integrated some of these system level uh, pathways, uh, the decentralization reforms that were in place at the time, etc. And to try and use both qualitative and quantitative methods to conduct a, a realist inquiry into looking at um, health services managers in government uh, district settings. It got featured as one of the papers of uh, on advancing uh, application of systems thinking in health, which is also, I think, a WHO Alliance um, effort. I think that's that that was one experience which really sort of helped me, you know, pick up systems thinking as an important element, uh, which has to be applied at the beginning of uh, effort itself and not merely as a tool, uh, you know, to do evaluation, etc. The second example I can share is um, is what you said, you know, about. Um, on tribal health and health of indigenous people with whom we work in southern Karnataka. And there, I think one insight, one tool, uh, which I, I would really plug into this discussion is uh, is really the participatory methods because systems thinking is it's also a way of thinking, right? And often we realize that it's our uh, educational system that has made us narrow, whereas people living in these realities are already uh, having this. This is what they live, right? And so um, setting up a context where one could listen to uh, answers to, for example, why, why is the situation of health like this in, in this neighborhood? What do you think explains it? And immediately you will hear the historical processes that have led to this, the, the neighborhood processes, etc. And it's, uh, you know, so that, that's been really enriching. And it's a very important tool, I feel, uh, for people who wish to get into systems thinking. And I think the main barrier for us researchers is, uh, is I think, openness, listening, humility, <laughs> etc., to remove all lot of uh, stuff that's that we have acquired in our you know masters and PhDs, and sometimes just sit down and listen. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Seeding control, right? Wow. Thank you. That's that's really great and, and provocative. And I think uh, this participatory piece really connects the systems thinking agenda to sort of rights-based and mobilization-based social justice motivated approaches to social change, right? So it makes it, uh, I think, a part of this kind of agenda as well, which for many of us is very exciting. So in light of that, I think one of the big developments of late, and we're all thinking about it, so I might as well ask it, is, is the pandemic. Using, as systems thinkers, each of you, I'm wondering, uh, what do you make of the pandemic and how it sort of expands or narrows the, the way that you approach your work and apply systems thinking? Well, I think the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, provided an example where system thinking is a must if you would respond efficiently to such a health threat. Because, you know, having a resilient health system is key 
to you know to respond and also having the flexibility to do for example task shifting mobilizing resources in, engaging with community social mobilization all of these elements is you know a key element of the response so i think the pandemic you know provided us with kind of a more evidence that systems thinking is the way forward and this was tested in few countries where you know and i think some low and middle income countries proved that you know having you know this kind of system thinking interventions or response would have better outcomes that even the more kind of a resource intensive uh, response in some high income countries and we've seen some examples from for example thailand and other countries where they were kind of at the heart of the pandemic at the beginning but they were able to control it because of this flexibility of this kind of resilience that they they demonstrated while other maybe um, maybe even high income countries they try to you know uh, to push a lot of resources in one direction and i think this was not productive and similarly in some complex settings we had expected in the beginning that the the death toll and the you know but the, the morbidity would be much higher but i think this was less than expected partially it might be uh, because of you know different uh, kind of holistic comprehensive response that some governmental and non-governmental actors you know have positioned themselves to respond uh, collectively to 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 this pandemic so i think this would change the mentality you know in the post covid world that we need to design our interventions you know, more and, and having this system thinking at the core of our uh, of our design which would i think uh, help us to you know demonstrate to other people this is the way forward thank you that that's also provocative changing the way we think and as prashant also was saying it is about a way of thinking isn't it so prashant your reflections on on the pandemic and what that's brought out yeah uh, i really agree with um, abdul karim um, uh, reflecting from our setting um, in in parts of india that i am familiar with i think one thing that for example the way uh, the plight of uh, people uh, i don't know migrant or not but people who are working in far away cities poor laborers and the, the uh, their plight during the lockdown which we imposed uh, really exposes uh, us to to think of consequences of you know command and control kind of measures which we automatically switch to uh, you know when there's a crisis you immediately want to take control that's not a time when you want to consult and you know include so how do we at a very systemic level move towards a system that's more caring and more inclusive uh, versus a command and control you know i, I think from that reflection what i what i uh, would like to submit is that we really need approaches that help us embrace uncertainty and i think systems thinking i come back to what i uh, began with so we need to be able to boldly accept uncertainty and i think this uh, how do we move towards having you know shaping uh, declaring values at a higher level but leaving operational stuff to lower levels and i think the if i look at the covid-19 response in india i think a very abstract satellite level reflection is that we flipped that we said okay how do we take control at higher levels and leave it to robot like operators at lower levels and i think we need to flip that model and some of these insights uh, would be very obvious to communities actually you know because they know communities uh, in my experience know that contexts are very different whereas the higher and higher up we go we we tend to decontextualize we tend to look at india as you know one country you know one guideline uh, for the country but as you decentralize you immediately know guidelines for a country don't work they need to be shaped locally and they need to be adapted locally i, I get a feeling that i'm i'm communicating something a bit fuzzy but i but i think we need to become comfortable with with that kind of uh, fuzziness you know <laughs> yeah i think i'll leave it at that yeah So well, thanks very much. I mean, we'll just wrap up and really sort of appreciate um the discussion today and the one thing uh, I I found really illuminating was some of the professional and personal experiences that you guys were able to bring into the discussion. So so thanks again. Thank you for listening. We hope this episode has inspired you to consider the relevance of systems thinking approaches in your work. Make sure you subscribe to seeing the full picture so that you don't miss an episode. 
You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.